you know, I did want to take this opportunity to thank the meeting organizers and particularly Dr. Connect for inviting me here to talk with you all and also congratulate everyone on a really great meeting so far. It's been a great uh, great panel discussion so far and, and really great turnout. Uh, so I'm going to talk about nasopharyngeal carcinoma, or NPC. And I thought what I would do is do a few introductory slides on some of the seminal uh, points of this uh, unique entity in head and neck cancer, and also on the treatment of locally advanced carcinoma. And then I have a few slides on thoughts about where we might head in the future in order to be able to make outcomes better, and in particular from the medical oncologist's point of view. So nasopharyngeal carcinoma really is a particularly unique type of head and neck cancer. Um, there are a number of different features that make head and neck cancer, I mean nasopharyngeal cancer, different from the other head and neck cancers that we deal with. Uh, first, of all, first of all, there's this interesting endemic pattern of disease where throughout the world, there's, uh, there's a band of um, increased incidence of nasopharyngeal carcinoma, particularly in southern China and Southeast Asia. And we don't know a whole lot about why that is. These nasopharynx cancers tend to be associated with EBV, but EBV infection is ubiquitous in the worldwide population. Uh, there are some HLA subtypes that might explain uh, some of this endemic pattern, but still this isn't really very well understood. Nasopharyngeal carcinoma also has uh, some unique features based on the anatomic location. So from a surgical point of view, there are some challenges. Um, first of all, it's the nasopharynx is posterior to the nasal cavity and abuts the base of skull. So many times, uh, uh, surgery is not an option at all because of base of skull involvement, or surgery can be challenging uh, because of the, how deep the, the tumors are. So for that that reason, it really has been our radiation oncology colleagues who have driven a lot of the development of treatment paradigms in this disease, and perhaps somewhat earlier uh, than in some of the other head and neck cancer subsites. Also, which uh, one thing that's particularly unique in head and neck cancer, uh, in nasopharynx cancer as compared to other head and neck subsites, is that NPCs are particularly sensitive to chemotherapy and radiation, more so than squamous cell carcinomas that might arise in the oropharynx, uh, the uh, larynx, or hypopharynx. Uh, but paradoxically, even though there is this greater sensitivity to chemotherapy and radiation, we actually, actually see more distant metastatic disease in this disease and also more lymph node involvement. So even though it is more chemo and radiation sensitive, uh, that's not necessarily the end of the story in terms of the prognosis. So in terms of upfront treatment for nasopharynx cancer, I think that it's fair to say that there is agreement that, that uh, uh, treatment must be based on a concurrent chemoradiotherapy approach for locally advanced disease. Uh, the role of chemotherapy with concurrent chemoradiotherapy is, of course, radiation sensitization. And I think that there's great data that shows that, that with the addition of chemotherapy, uh, particularly bolus-cisplatin chemotherapy to radiation, you get better local regional control. And that uh, hopefully can translate into better overall survival for our patients. What's also of interest, though, is the idea that chemotherapy can be used as systemic treatment to treat mic uh, micrometastatic disease and thereby reduce the incidence of, of distant met uh, metastases in patients who present with locally advanced disease. But this is where the problem is. You know, we've figured out well that concurrent chemoradiotherapy works best, but we really don't know how to add in uh, more systemic doses of chemotherapy that can reduce the risk of distant metastatic disease in the future. We don't know what the, the optimal sequencing is, and I think we, don't, we haven't really shown what the optimal chemotherapy regimen is in this regard as well. So there are at least 15 randomized controlled trials looking at chemotherapy and radiation in nasopharynx cancer. And then there are four meta-analyses that have been performed as well. Um, but even with this uh, uh, great abundance of data, still there's no 
broad consensus on exactly the best way to take advantage of these two treatment modalities. Um, some of the problems have been that we have inconsistent results from very similarly designed studies. And then also the studies across the world have involved very different patient populations. The, there's a variable EBV association with nasopharynx cancers, as I mentioned. So in the North American population, uh, much uh, uh, fewer uh, nasopharynx cancers will be caused by EBV compared to in Asia. And then also that uh, uh, is associated with differences in the dominant histologies. So there's the WHO histologic criteria for nasopharynx cancer. WHO type 1 cancers are, are classic squamous cell carcinomas. They tend not to be associated with EBV. Those tend to be much more common in uh, Caucasian populations, such as the North American population. And WHO type 2 and 3 are less and less uh, well-differentiated carcinomas. And those tend to be very frequently associated with, uh, with uh, EBV. In, uh, infection in the tumors themselves. We also have in the clinical trials that have been done to date a wide variation in the ethnic eth ethnicities involved. So we don't really know um, how a North American population is going to respond to uh, uh, chemotherapy as compared to uh, an Asian population. And there may be ethnic differences in how uh, different populations handle different chemotherapy agents uh, that can explain some of the troubles that we have in figuring out how to best treat these, this, uh, these patients. And then lastly, there have been a number of different uh, treatment regimens that have been uh, studied in uh, these uh, 15 randomized controlled trials, so it's very difficult to know for sure which the best chemotherapy regimen is. There have been big differences in radiotherapy as well uh, as the technologies have, uh, have evolved. Uh, so, you know, no longer are patients being treated with the old types of, of radiation therapy. 3D conformal radiation is probably done in many places. I IMRT is certainly going to be done wherever it's available, and now even proton therapy is uh, becoming more and more common in nasopharynx cancer. So there's been a great deal of evolution in radiotherapy. And then another uh, challenge in interpreting the data has been uh, that some, a number of the seminal studies that have been done have had a less than ideal study design. So that makes it difficult to know how best we can incorporate chemotherapy. And one of the uh, landmark studies, of course, in nasopharynx cancer is the U.S. intergroup uh, 0099 study published by Al Saraf and colleagues in 1998. So this uh, study design randomized patients uh, to radiation therapy alone versus radiation therapy plus bolus cisplatin, followed by three cycles of adjuvant cisplatin and 5-FU. Uh, the original uh, study design plan to enroll 270 patients. The study, however, was closed early at 193 patients after interim analysis showed that there was this very dramatic uh, uh, pro progression-free survival benefit and also very dramatic overall survival benefit. So that at three years with the chemoradiotherapy arm, 78% of patients were were alive compared to 47% with the radiation alone arm. So the study was closed early. Uh, the results also were notable for improvement in local regional control and also a decrease in distant metastatic disease in the patients who had received the, the chemotherapy. So this uh, study has really sent, set uh, a, a precedence uh, for future studies, as well as a, a very common approach, at least in North America, to the treatment of nasopharynx cancers. There are, however, several caveats with the intergroup study. Um, you know, it's, it's really not the perfect study design, unfortunately, because the, uh, the way that the chemotherapy was added uh, with uh, both concurrent chemotherapy and adjuvant chemotherapy. So we really don't know, do you need to have the adjuvant chemotherapy at all to attain the benefits? Uh, and is there any additional benefit to the addition of the adjuvant chemotherapy, or is the concurrent bolus cisplatin enough? Uh, another caveat is that the study was terminated early, and early termination of, of studies, of course, uh, 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 runs the risk that the uh, uh, large outcome benefit was due to chance alone, uh, rather than if the study had accrued the number of patients that it was originally powered to accrue. 
Another point is that the radiation therapy alone arm of the Alsarov study did perform a little bit worse than you'd expect with less than 50% of the patients alive uh, at three years. And then older uh, radiation therapy techniques were utilized in the study that perhaps might account for uh, why those patients didn't do quite as well as expected. But that's been a, uh, one of the questions in terms of interpreting the final results. Another big problem is that this was a North American study. So many of the patients had the WHO type 1 nasopharynx cancer that's not EBV associated. So is it really fair to extrapolate these data to the wider worldwide population where, in which more, the majority of patients will have EBV positive nasopharynx cancer? Uh, and then lastly, uh, with this uh, uh, design, uh, patients are given adjuvant cisplatin and 5-FU chemotherapy after receiving chemoradiotherapy to the head and neck area. And here's the problem with adjuvant cisplatin and 5-FU in nasopharynx cancer. You're trying to give cisplatin and 5-FU, which is particularly toxic to the mucosa, in patients who are coming out of chemoradiotherapy looking like this. So this severe mucositis that patients get with chemoradiotherapy, I think, limits uh, what you can do with an adjuvant 5-FU-based regimen. And this is, was seen in the Alsarov study where uh, only about 50% of patients were able to receive the adjuvant 5-FU as it had been prescribed. Another issue that has muddied the waters a bit in terms of how to best approach locally advanced disease is that subsequent uh, uh, confirmatory trials have actually been contradictory. So there are two very good, large Asian studies that have been done, uh, one out of Singapore and one out of the group in, in Hong Kong, uh, both very uh, similar studies looking at patients with WHO type 2 and 3 disease, so obviously mostly EBV positive. And then both studies compared uh, the uh, bolus platin plus radiation followed by uh, adjuvant PF to radiation alone, as in the Alsarov study. Now, there were some slight differences in the patient populations in these two studies. The Singapore study uh, had patients who had mostly T3 or T4 disease or N2 or N3 disease, whereas the Hong Kong study had fewer very large uh, primary tumors and more patients uh, had locally advanced disease based on their nodal status. But otherwise, they were similar in their patient populations. The results, however, were not similar. So the, uh, uh, there was a statistically significant three-year overall survival benefit in the Singapore study, uh, which was very impressive. Uh, however, that was not seen at all in the Hong Kong study. And again, if you look at the rate of distant metastatic disease, again, the, the chemotherapy patients in the Singapore study did better than the patients who received radiation alone. But those results were not duplicated in the Hong Kong study. So these uh, uh, two confirmatory studies really haven't done anything uh, to confirm uh, the use of the Alsterhoff regimen in nasopharynx cancer after all. So we also have data from meta-analyses. Uh, this is the largest meta-analysis that was done, uh, done by the meta-analysis uh, collaborative group uh, uh, out of the UK. And basically, the question of this meta-analysis done in eight trials, uh, almost 2,000 patients, was to determine whether there's benefit to adding chemotherapy to radiation on survival in nasopharynx cancer. And indeed, there is. There's a small 6% uh, absolute survival benefit to the addition of any chemotherapy at five years uh, in this patient population. They also teased out whether uh, you get the greatest benefit from concurrent chemotherapy, adjuvant, or induction chemotherapy. So if you look at the hazard ratios for concurrent chemotherapy, which are right here, overall, uh, there's a statistically significant benefit to the addition of concurrent chemotherapy. And you don't see that with the addition of induction chemotherapy, which is here, or the addition of adjuvant chemotherapy that is here. So there, uh, the authors of the study concluded that chemotherapy added to radiation does indeed yield, yield a small statistically significant survival benefit in this patient population, and it looks like that benefit is primarily from concurrent chemotherapy. However, again, I think that there are some caveats uh, here. You know, first of all, a meta-analysis um, 
uh, can't tell us exactly what the best chemotherapy regimen, what the best chemotherapy sequencing is. We can get broad ideas uh, from meta-analyses that I think we should use to guide our future treatments, but, uh, but uh, the heterogeneity of studies that are involved, the heterogeneity of patients, the heterogeneity of chemotherapy regimens makes it difficult for us to conclude exactly how to best use chemotherapy. We, I think what the meta-analysis tells us is that there is indeed a role for 